thank you so much for that kind introduction and, and to the organizers for selecting my talk. And, and uh, today, if you, if you bear with me, I'm, I'm going to take you a little bit away from the higher order chromatin structures, uh, but maybe worth it to, to focus uh, on the um, uh, underlying uh, fundamental structure, uh, which, uh, which in this case is going to take us on, on, on a journey to, uh, to discover the very early stages of chromatin assembly. Uh, and today I'll be presenting a novel pathway for nuclear import and folding of histones, uh, H3 and H4 as monomers. So as I'm sure everyone is very well aware in the audience, uh, chromatin is composed of an array of proteins uh, and genomic DNA, whose integrity is crucial for genomic regulation, stability, replication, and, and repair, and essentially taking part in every DNA-related process. Uh, so histones are among the most abundant nuclear proteins, uh, functioning in both packaging and regulating access to DNA for each of these processes. And they do so uh, by forming the nucleosome, which is a histone octamer uh, wrapped around uh, 150 DNA base pairs or so. So histones contain a globular uh, core, uh, which forms the histone fold domain. Uh, this domain requires of, of a dimerization partner to form, and as we can see here in this cartoon, histone H3 uh, dimerizes with histone H4. And you can see here labeled the alpha, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 helixes. Uh, and, and particularly for, for histone H3, it possesses one additional alpha helix uh, term as N alpha helix as, as, as is within the N tail of the histone. And then they go together to form the tetramer, which is the core of the nucleosome, which is uh, finalized with two, uh, two pairs of uh, histone H2A and H2B dimers. So the way they, they, they associate with DNA is by, uh, by uh, several uh, interactions and, and notably uh, they are sole bridge interactions enabled by, by rich arginine and lysine tails and core. And, and uh, these, uh, due to this uh, uh, highly uh, basic nature, Histones are prone to aggregation in isolation, and they do precipitate easily at physiological salt concentrations. So in order to overcome this and to help them uh, undergo this dimerization uh, and, and, and nucleosome formation, uh, there is a, a cohort of uh, protein binding partners, uh, today known as histone chaperones. So through intense uh, years of research, uh, the following picture has emerged. So histones are uh, synthesized in, in the cytoplasm and the ribosomes, uh, like any other protein, uh, and they, they are folded by heat, heat shock uh, proteins and quickly translocated into the nucleus by carrier proteins, uh, known as importins. And in the case of histone H3 and H4, uh, it is of uh, noted interest in protein 4. Uh, once they are in the nucleus, uh, a small GTP binding uh, protein run uh, facilitates the dissociation of, of, of the carrier cargos and, uh, and release. And, and, and here I will introduce uh, the first histone chaperone, ASF1 and the silicic factor 1, as a key component of the H3H4 chaperone pathway, which is linking the soluble histones with the chromatin deposition complexes. And in addition to ASF1, um, uh, I have to highlight a HAT1, histone acetyl transferase 1, and its partner RBBP7 which are in charge of interacting with histone H4 and, and acetylating at lysines 5 and 12. And, and finally, together with them, I will introduce uh, another one more histone chaperone, NASP, which is also soluble histone chaperone. And, and, and they all do interact together, forming what is known as the major soluble complex, uh, whose, whose task is to pass on the histone H3 and H4 dimer into isoform uh, histone deposition factors. And these ones, they, they will act uh, replication dependent or independently to, to form the nucleosomes. So just very recently, uh, in fact, it's, it's only a, a preprint, uh, it's been made public, the, the structure of, of importing four together with uh, histone H3 and H4, uh, displaying a strong interaction of the uh, histone H3 N tail and alpha N helix, as you can see here. And, and, and this was uh, previously uh, um, um, characterized biochemically. And, 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 and what is interesting as well of this structure is that it presents ASF1 uh, binding exactly as it was known to be binding when, when this structure uh, was uh, um, characterized in isolation. 
And, and further to the interest of the, of the structural biology community, just a, a few months back, two groups uh, presented uh, the structure of, of H3 and H4 together with AS, ASF1 and the core of, of NASP, uh, where again, the N-terminus tail and an alpha N helix of H3 is important for the, for the association with NASP. And this was also uh, a following uh, biochemical uh, description. And, and, and what is even more interesting, one of these groups went further and crystallized another uh, uh, previously observed interaction between histone H3 alpha 3 helix uh, and, and, and NASP. And, and this was also described biochemically. And, and, and this, this structure is very interesting uh, because as we can see here, uh, they are completely, these modes of binding, they are completely incompatible with each other. Uh, so here the alpha-3 helix uh, binding to, to NASP couldn't uh, any longer bind to ASF1, which has this very particular and, and unique mode of binding, right? And, and in addition to that, in, in this way of binding, uh, histone H3 is completely unable to, to form the histone fold and dimerize with histone H4. Um, so um, just to, to shed some light to this kind of conundrum, uh, previously in, in the lab, um, by using a GFP trap pull down of uh, TAG, ASF1 and NASP, uh, we can see uh, how in, in Comasi stains, how ASF1 very nicely re uh, recapitulates the H3, H4 perfect one-to-one -one ratios. Uh, but interestingly, in the case of NASP, that was not the case. And there was a large uh, uh, over excess of histone H3 over histone H4. So uh, these uh, uh, allowed uh, the group to propose that there must be an additional um, pool of uh, histone H3 as a monomer associating with NASP enabled by this uh, additional type of binding. So here's where it comes to my postdoc, where, where I wanted to try and, and further uh, uh, see uh, and determine the structure, uh, pardon, not the structure, but the, 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 the binding interactions and that they could have in, this, in these different modes of, of NASP. So basically, I, I started by taking these pull downs and try and fractionate them uh, and, and see, and see which, which are the, the possible different interactions there. And to do this, uh, uh, I used uh, gentle separation based on glycerol gradients, uh, which then uh, by high speed centrifugations uh, can be split into, into, into different fractions. And we saw indeed that uh, we could see a, a highly rich NASP uh, uh, bands corresponding to H3, where we couldn't detect any H4, and then we could detect a H4 and H3 together with, with, the, with the components uh, had one an RPBP7 of the soluble um, uh, major complex. And, and to try and give a bit of, um, a bit of uh, further uh, resolution to this complex, we, we, we then used a native gel electrophoresis, which allowed a quite nice band separation. And, and this can be followed by a, a second dimension on an SDS page, uh, which uh, showed quite nicely an H3 and H4, as you can see here at the bottom. And, and, and what it was really, really nice to see was this, this dot here completely separated from the other populations, from the other uh, protein complexes, and where it wasn't detectable at all, any, any histone H4. And this was confirmed by Western blood. So, so we're quite certain about the existence of this of these monomer uh, histone H3 bound to NASP. So we, we further chop out those bands and, and, and send them for, for, for mass spec. And here you can see each, each of these bars represent uh, uh, replicate and, and it very nicely confirmed those results. And interestingly, we saw that in, in, in a proportion, we estimate around 10th of the, of the complex. Uh, we also see another partner there binding, uh, a protein uh, uh, known as UBR7. And in addition to, to that, we could see that, that for, for bands uh, uh, nine and 10, uh, as, as band seven, we, we could kind of separate uh, it per, perhaps in two forming uh, parts what, 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 what is known as the, the uh, major soluble complex. In one of them, uh, we didn't see uh, ASF1 binding, perhaps uh, as an earlier representative of, of the complex as, as, as the dimer is forming and maturing. 
and then one fully mature when we saw uh, a strong binding of ASF1. And interestingly, a decrease in, in, in HAT1, uh, perhaps meaning that the uh, acetyltransferase uh, function was already accomplished then, and it was therefore disengaged from, from, uh, from this complex. Um, so we can go back to the model and add all of these. Uh, and, and there we have our, our histone H3 and NASP and uh, our uh, um, dissociation or, or uh, breakup in stages of the formation of the major soluble complex. So the next question was, uh, can we in, in any other way uh, try to understand what other proteins may be binding to, to these histones as monomers? Uh, since since they, they move really quickly through, through this pathway. And, and also what is happening with H4? And to answer to these questions, uh, we try to generate uh, mutations that would uh, prevent the dimerization, basically using um, a trapping strategy. And for that, we designed two different types of mutations. Uh, one disrupting the uh, alpha-2 helix, which is essential for the, for the histone fold. Uh, by inserting three glycines in the middle of it and adding a lot of uh, freedom of torsion. And we call this, this mutation a helix breaker mutation. And uh, to follow a, di a completely different approach, we replaced uh, bulky hydrophobic um, amino acids uh, across, across the interaction with alanines, which should respect the alpha helix, but should decrease the specificity and therefore the affinity of the interaction. And we call this a fall disruptor, so FD for short. So what we saw was that the mutants uh, um, tagged with uh, GFP, they were capable of locating to the nucleus, but pretty much like the wild type did. Uh, but interestingly, uh, when looking at uh, uh, cells in, 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 in metaphase, uh, these, uh, they weren't incorporating into, into the mitotic chromosomes suggesting that they were unfolding properly. Uh, and the same happened for, for the H4 mutations. And, and when we looked at uh, um, pull downs, we couldn't see any, any interaction with their corresponding partners. So meaning that they were probably not dimerizing they, and therefore that explains why they weren't in the, in the, in the, in the um, chromosomes, in the mitotic chromosomes. So basically the strategy worked very nicely. So then we went on uh, to, to, to do the proteomics and try and see uh, and bias which um, uh, interactors were occurring there. So here in these scatter plots, uh, uh, I, am, I am displaying the uh, peptide normalized intensity uh, uh, for the uh, monomer mutant versus the wild type on the y-axis, the monomer on the x-axis and the wild type on the x-axis. So anything that we see on the diagonal would have similar affinities where things that they are accumulated on this uh, top uh, left corner, they are uh, binding much strongly to the, to the wild type. And it was quite reassuring to see that uh, heterodimer binder obliga ob obligates, uh, such as ASF1, they were, they were basically gone from, from the um, um, mutant uh, monomer, as well as uh, the nucleosome deposition impactors. And um, we also lost uh, HAT1 and, and RBBP7 and importing four, uh, reassuringly, with the structure that I just showed you before. Well, it was a surprise. It was to see importing five there, uh, which is, was also known as a, as a uh, partially redundant uh, importing in the, in the uh, import of uh, histones H3 and H4. And, and also we confirmed the, the result with NASP. And the other mutant gave very much the same results. Um, and in the case of the H4 mutants, what we saw is that we lost, as well as the di uh, dimerized obligate interactors, uh, we, we, we lost NASP. So we lost the interaction with the H3 binder, but it was very strongly retained the interaction with the HAT1 RBBP7 complex. And it was also retained the interaction with importing five and the same happened with the other mutants. So, uh, we, we come to a point where we can add to the model a, uh, the importing five as an enabler of the translocation of, of monomeric histones. And, and it was very interesting to ask the question, uh, what sort of interaction is happening between, between the importings and the, and the chaperone nucle nuclear receptors? And to try to address this, we went to a minimal system where with purified proteins, 
uh, would separate them on, on a glycerol gradient. So here you can see them just on their own, but we can do this as well in competition. And to our surprise, what we saw is that the importing uh, had a greater affinity for, for the histone compared to, to, to NASP. And, and the only thing that we could do to recapitulate a little bit closer uh, to what would be the conditions in, in, the, in the nucleus, as, a, as if you remember I, I introduced uh, in, the, in the introduction, um, importance they require uh, or they use uh, the, the interaction with a, a small GTP binding protein run in order to uh, dislodge their cargos when they once they enter the nucleus. So once we used uh, run, and, and it was only run GTP, as it would be found in the nucleus and not uh, without it, as it would be found in the cytoplasm, when, when actually uh, an interaction was found, and this was uh, uh, sufficient to dislodge the histone towards the histone chaperone. So this was uh, really satisfying to see and, and gave us really a lot of confidence in the model. Uh, but the, the truth is that, uh, like, if you allow me the mean, uh, some interactions may be really fast uh, and the histone basketball ball may be passing around the chaperones really quickly, although crucially. So uh, what we needed to do to prove such a dynamic uh, system uh, would be some sort of pulse chase approach where we can identify interactions of newly synthesized histones as they progress. Uh, but this is very difficult with current pulse chase approaches, such as like, you may be familiar with snap tag or halo tag as their progression uh, in the pathway is, 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 is faster than the synthesis and labeling protocols. So to overcome this, uh, we got around by using a tether and release approach called rapid release, uh, previously developed in the lab, which consists of localizing uh, nuclear uh, protein uh, co-translationally uh, to, the, to the mitochondrial membrane uh, as a means of anchoring it through a tether uh, to the cytoplasm. And at certain desired time, we can just add a pulse of, of rapamycin, which is a very quickly diffusing drug, which will induce a dimerization of a protease immediately releasing our nuclear factor. And then we can track it through a fluorescent tag or, or, or any other tag. So here in this movie, you can see um, a fluorescent tag uh, histone H3 with GFP uh, leaving the mitochondrial network and entering the nucleus and, and reaching even in, in chromatin fossa. Uh, so one of the benefits of this approach is that uh, any protein or enzyme tag can be added and, and, and this can be used for BioID, for instance, uh, adding like uh, something like an apex, apex tag, uh, which can help to do uh, uh, time result proteomics. So we did do that and, and the results showed uh, to our satisfaction and to, to, to some great extent to our surprise, the importing five was actually a stronger binder over importing four, uh, giving us very confidence on our model. And, and we did see the text as well, the nuclear chaperones and, and the chromatin factors on later time points. So just to wind up the, the model, um, well, I, I'm going to finish up presenting um, uh, some, some results that uh, we did once again using this, uh, this pulse release system. Uh, in addition to tagging uh, the endogenous NASP with, uh, with EGFP uh, by means of a CRISPR knock-in. And, and what we saw uh, with, uh, with pull downs is, it was that the, as soon as you release the histone uh, from, the, from the cytoplasm, we can see a very strong interaction. And as time passes by and the pulse uh, gets into the, into the uh, nucleus and the chromatin actually, uh, uh, then it wanes off from, from the interaction with the soluble complexes and, and it gets in, um, associated with DNA. So the final model uh, is basically to highlight this monomer pathway. And, and uh, if, if you liked it or you're interested to, to read more about it, we've just uh, put the preprint out and, and uh, hopefully it will be published soon. And, and just quickly, I'm so sorry about the time. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my boss, uh, friend and, uh, and uh, this allowed me to toy around with his favorite uh, project for this year. And, and I'll be very happy to take any questions and thank you so much for your attention. That's beautiful work Alonso, thank you. Maybe my question is silly, but uh, just a clarification. So what is the biological relevance of, of importing a single, a single histone at a time instead of having it as a timer? 
I think that is the key question. I think that is the wi the winning question. Um, I think to answer that, we have to consider the 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 event of folding, of the event of of the uh, and and if this can happen in the cytoplasm, um, uh, I, I guess this could be an alternate pathway, and and there is no reason to to think that one pathway may be over uh, over the other one. Um, in my view, the advantage of, uh, of this monomer pathway is, since we've seen this, this very strong interaction of the importings, is that we locate very quickly the histones in the environment where they have receptors uh, capable of uh, uh, solubilizing them, uh, such as NASPAN had one, and, and, and then they provide the time and the, and the environment for, for their dimerization. Um, and and I, I'm presuming that in, in the other, in, in the uh, 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 dimer pathway, we, we are also um, seeing this and yeah. 